Their first circumnavigation started in 1968. It took them 11 years and had them land in 47 different countries on a homemade wooden boat with no engine. Their motto? As long as it's fun. Arguably the first really successful and famous cruising couple, they made the idea of selling everything and jumping on a cheap boat to set sail a more mainstream plan by talking and writing about their experiences so that more of us could take that plunge. And the engineless 200,000 nautical mile multiple circumnavigations under their keel gave them the reputation to be the best small boat sailors in the world from any era this week on Everything You Need to Know, we're paying our respects to the grandparents of cruising, Lynn and Larry Party. I can't stress to you enough the importance of this cruising couple in my own life. They are what got me through the 10 years of planning. It took me to really make the sailing life work for me. They motivated me, and every question I had along the way, which was often, they always had an answer. They voyaged the world and funded the whole thing by becoming prolific sailing authors and about as famous as you could be in the sailing world. This is a story of two people who blazed a trail for everyone else who would come behind them. Larry was also Canadian. He was born in British Columbia in 1939 as the world was plunging into World War II. Lynn, on the other hand, was born in 1944 in the Motor City in Detroit. Um, now, I was born and raised right across the river from Detroit in Windsor, so it kind of hits close to home for me as well. Can you imagine growing up in Detroit in the 60s at the height of the muscle cars and some of the greatest music ever made? Now, it's not to say that Detroit doesn't have a solid sailing community, because they really do. I sail with a lot of those guys. But Larry, being from Victoria, British Columbia, on the Pacific Ocean, would have certainly been had sailing injected into his life as he grew up. He started with a small dugout canoe when he was a kid, and then he had a rowboat that he rigged with a wooden stick and a wool blanket for a sail. Now, Larry found work in his teenage years in a sawmill, which is sort of the family business, and eventually landed himself a Tumlaren sloop, a keelboat, which he called Annalisa. Working away, Larry started to lust for adventure and travel, and remembering what his grandfather always told him, do what you love, which is still good advice. Larry pulled up stakes. So Larry sold Annalisa for five grand, and with his friend Brian, they jumped in Brian's car, and the pair of them drove down the coast to California in search of some kind of adventure. Almost right away, wandering from one bar to another, trying to meet people in the sailing community, uh, Larry met a man sort of down on his luck, and the man was trying to get to Vancouver, where Larry had just come from which is sort of weird. Larry spotted the guy 40 bucks and bought him a bus ticket, and uh, they, the two parted ways. Uh, now, this is important, and I can't stress this enough. Anybody who's been cruising is going to understand what I'm about to say. As I set out to adventure on a sailboat or chase that dream, I realized how sort of kismet the sailing world really is. Karma and destiny play a huge role as you point your life at some great adventure. Strange things start to happen. Weird coincidences. Everything just sort of starts to feel meant to be in some very deep and profound way. And I know that sounds silly, unless you've done it. It's really not silly. Brittany from Wind Traveler, which is like my favorite sailing blog, she once said, It's not something that you notice right away, because you can't see the dots connecting as you move forward. But when you look back in hindsight, you can see the dots and how they were connected the whole time. So Larry wandered around the docks in San Francisco looking for work and trying to meet other sailors or people that were connected to the sailing community. He then found himself in LA, sort of doing the same thing, and eventually he landed in Newport Beach, still searching for contacts in the sailing world. Then the kismet stuff started to strike again. Larry's wandering through a boatyard and he meets another sailor named Ralph, who sailed a fairly rare boat. The boat that Ralph had was a Tumlaren sloop, the same kind as Annalisa, which Larry had sold not too long ago to fund his adventure to California. Uh, Ralph even agreed to take Larry for a sail. The two of them had a great day. Within a few days, Larry's career actually got started. The work he was putting in pounding pavement, he got a lead on a boat headed out soon. 
into the Pacific, bound for Hawaii. So uh, the boat was called the Double Eagle, a bohemian schooner, 85 feet long, 140 tons, built in the Bahamas. When they actually added the ballast to the boat, um, they just poured quick dry cement in it until the boat sat where they wanted it to sit. That was the ballast. Um, it was actually headed to Hawaii at the time to help film some B-roll sort of background shots for a TV show they were filming at the time called The Wackiest Ship in the Army, which later Larry would actually appear in for a few seconds wearing a hula skirt, which is another one of their funny stories. So Larry heads down to the docks and he finds the boat, the Double Eagle, and he lands a job. But what's more important than the job is who the captain of the Double Eagle is. He's a legendary seaman, a legendary captain, a legendary rigger, traveler. He's known as the very best schooner captain anywhere in the Pacific. A legend. The man's name was Bob Sloan, um, who at this point had already spent more than half of his life at sea. Now, Bob hired Larry, and Bob taught Larry a lot. Line splicing, wire splicing, celestial navigation, how to use a sextant, and maybe most impactful is Bob had a history of building his own boats, which may have given Larry the flair and confidence to build his own boats too. Uh, now, Captain Bob took a really quick liking to Larry, his newest crew member, and on their way back to Newport Beach after massive adventures in Hawaii that I won't have time to tell you, um, he told Larry that when we get back, I'll help you get a work visa so you can stay in the U.S. Um, I think right now the rule is like six months unless you get a work visa. I don't know what it was back then. Um, but Bob wanted to keep Larry on staff. The two of them really hit it off, so he's going to help him get a, a work visa. Now, Larry was a really good-looking guy, and he did really well with the ladies. A whole bunch of side stories that I don't have time to get into. He was being recruited by one of these ladies to try and become an actor. Let's join the Hollywood scene, right? Um, he's in the right place. Um, she tried to mentor him, and the path was pretty clear that he had a pretty good shot at going down the movie star path, which likely would have resulted with him becoming a fairly large movie star. He's very talented, he's good looking, uh, but alas, Larry wasn't interested in fortune and fame. He just wanted to go adventuring. So now you might be thinking at this point, how does this adventurous boy from British Columbia, who landed himself in California, end up meeting a sweet girl from Detroit? In California, no less. Uh, Lynn had been sailing a couple of times in her childhood. Her family had a little sailboat on the lakes of Michigan. But her father was relocated for his work, and he moved the family because of the work relocation. And where did he go? California. That's quite the relocation package. Now, don't think that Larry is the only one with some amazing story and lust for adventure. Lynn found herself in California as she got a little bit older, in a corporate job, she was really good with numbers, working for Bob's Big Boy in California when the company was still sort of young. And the owner was famous for giving some of the higher level employees stock options and profit sharing. Had she had stuck out that job, it's very likely she would have retired early in her life with millions of dollars in the bank. But Lynn too had other plans. She was gorgeous. And she was dating regularly, but something was missing. The people in her world, in her bubble, she found them sort of boring. Um, Lynn notes that one day she turned to her corporate co-worker in the cubicle next to her and just blurted out, I'd like to buy a sailboat. Now her co-worker motioned to a picture on the wall in the office they worked in together, and it was a picture of a sailboat. It was Bob's big boy owned sailboat. Um, they, the company originally used it as the flagship for their shrimp boat fleet um, because seafood was big on their menu at the time. Um, but more recently, Lynn's boss had actually taken sort of private ownership of this boat, no longer used for shrimping, and he made it his personal yacht. Now, this is the owner of Bob's Big Boy Corporation, so um, he had money, and he has this big, beautiful yacht, so it has a full-time captain that he had hired, and the captain's always going to be on it. So... Um, it sort of dawned on the co-worker and Lynn to, you know, get a hold of this guy. There's sort of a corporate connection, and maybe he can get her into the sailing world a little bit because she wants to buy a boat. So Lynn finds his number. She calls the captain. She had no idea who he was. He didn't know who she was. Um, but he invited her down to the docks nonetheless. He just happened to have for sale a little sailing tender, like eight feet. Um, and she had a couple hundred bucks to blow, so she figured, okay, great idea. So she's excited. She heads down to the docks to see the tender of the mothership of Bob's big boy shrimping fleet. 
um, she was astounded by the bigger boat when she got there and she banged on the hull to get the captain's attention um, she was very very attractive and when the captain popped out to greet her he immediately started to try to charm her now this captain his name was Bob Sloan the very same Bob Sloan that Larry had just been sailing with to Hawaii the boat the double eagle kismet I'm telling you so Bob supposed to be selling her an eight-foot sailing dinghy, um, did everything he could to put the moves on her. Over the course of the next few days, they hung out, and he started to take her for dinner, and he played music for her on his guitar on the on the Double Eagle. And she found herself eventually at a bar with him, a bar called the Anchor Cove. It was sort of a favorite hangout of the local sailing talent. Lynn played along because part of breaking away from the corporate world was to meet new and interesting people outside of that you know, bubble of guys that she was dating. And hanging out with Bob Sloan, that started to happen right away. At Anchor Cove, as Bob was at the bar hitting on her, she noticed there were two other men in the bar playing pool. One man, noticing how obviously hot she was, came up right away, and Bob chased him away quite quickly. The other man playing pool was more reserved and seemed less interested, but he knew Bob, and he eventually did make his way over to say hi to them. Who's this, Bob? This reserved man asked, and... Bob replied, Larry, this is Lynn. Lady K Sailing is brought to you by patrons, people who give a couple of bucks an episode to keep this channel improving and make this all possible. I want to give a big shout out to this week's newest patron, JR. Welcome to the team. Thank you. To say that Lynn and Larry hit it off would be an understatement. Three days after they met, they were together, and I mean together, truly till death do them part. Larry was still chasing his dream, and Lynn was now solidly invested in that dream. And Larry had already started building a boat out of wood with no engine. In 1968, they got married, and three days later, and maybe the best honeymoon gift ever, they launched that boat. It was called Seraphin, and she would carry them on the greatest adventure of their lives thus far. They set out at their own pace with the goal of just exploring other places and meeting new people. Adventure. No set destination. And now the goal is never to circumnavigate, but rather to spend as much time as possible exploring the world, strange new lands. They would set up shop only when they needed to stop to make money. And sort of in random countries, they would do boat work and deliveries and rigging, um, and they would do some writing about their experiences. Eventually, they found themselves crossing the halfway point of rounding the entire planet. Cape Horn, it, everything. And they figured it just made sense to keep going. Um, it was a shorter distance home than turning around. When they finally completed, after 11 years and 47 countries, they found themselves back at home base. In 1985, they built yet another small boat, and I mean less than 30 feet. Again, wood, no engine, and they set out again. Now, with Lynn's writing at this point, um, they had you know, gained as much notoriety as they needed that they were financially independent. And they found themselves in New Zealand eventually where they bought a little boatyard and used that as home base for the rest of their lives, but they kept cruising. In 2009, they set out again, this time from California, eventually finding themselves back in New Zealand where they continued cruising sort of locally. The Cruising Club of America eventually awarded them the Far Horizon Award in recognition of their accomplishments and 200,000 nautical miles, and the Seven Seas Cruising Association gave them a very prestigious and very seldom handed out award, the SSCA Award. In their travels, they released 12 books, 5 DVDs on cruising, and in 2014, Herb McCormick released an excellent autobiography on them. It's called, As Long As It's Fun, The Epic Voyages and Extraordinary Times of Lynn and Larry Party. It's worth a read. The inspiring story of Lynn and Larry would take hours for me to tell you everything properly. The side adventures, the Larry's early years, Lynn's early years. They have so many documented stories of almost hitting rocks off Cape Horn. And just, it's so inspiring and so... You become so saturated in the stories that they tell because they are such great storytellers. I, I couldn't possibly do it in the time we have in a YouTube video, and this video is already going long. I could go for hours. If you're truly interested in cruising, please take the time to research their whole story. 
it's months of reading, and you'll love every minute of it. In 2015, Larry developed Parkinson's disease, and while Lynn would visit him quite often, she continued sailing between those visits. So it wasn't just Larry with some girl who wanted to go adventuring with him. They're both truly sailors. Larry eventually succumbed to that disease, and he died on July 27, 2020. And the world lost a legend, a sailing father figure, an inspiration to us all, and a man who gave so very much to the sailing community. He will never be replaced. If you're interested in cruising and looking for books to read as you prepare for your epic adventure, anything by Lynn and Larry Party will steer you well. I can't recommend them enough. Until next week, guys, stay safe. Thank you.